<clears throat> Here we start the first of the Sphiros, Keser, excuse me, Hochma. Perak Shlishi, Mem Bet. Hech Yargi Lo Dom Atzma Midas a Hochma. This is the second Sphiro, right? Yes. So if you remember just sort of introductory words about Hochma, um, we mentioned that um, Keser is the all inclusive Sphiro. Within Keser, you have Hochma Bina and Das. Chesed Gvura to first Netzachod Yesod and Malchus. Chokma is the first Sphira underneath, underneath Keser. We said that Keser is Ayin. This is nothingness, nullification. Whereas Chokma is Yesh. Chokma is the beginning, the conception of being. If Keser is totally hollow, having within it nothingness and therefore able to contain within it everything, Chokhmah is the beginning of the crystallization of Ayin into Yesh. Like it says in the Pasuk, Chokhmah mi Ayin timitzeh. Chokhmah from Ayin comes into being. The Pasuk Shad is Chokhmah mi Ayin timitzeh. Wisdom, where will you find? But the Kabbalists understand it to mean Chokhmah mi Ayin timitzeh. Chokhmah comes from Ayn. So Yesh is from Ayn. Chokhmah is Yesh. <clears throat> Still, Chokhmah is a very high sphera. If we said that Chokhmah, for example, corresponds to the brain, the right hemisphere of the brain, Bina, the left, so Chokhmah is to the right, it's masculine, it would correspond to the life-giving fluid, the drop, the drop of life, which contains within it really nothing specialized, yet it has within it everything in potential, which is different than Chochmah. Chochmah is Ein, it's nothingness. Keser is Ein, it's nothingness. Keser. Yeah? Chochmah is Yesh, but it's undifferentiated Yesh. It's it's yesh, which has not been operated upon or gestated by bina. But, okay? So what it means is, it's yesh, but in potential. So that if, 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 if keser is a nothing which has within it everything, chokhmah is a something within which nothing is specialized. Okay? That, that's a major difference. So that Chokhmah is similar to Ayn, insofar as Chokhmah contains within it everything. It gets that property from Keser. Keser begets Chokhmah. Okay? But that's a major difference. That Keser is, is a nothing which has within it everything. And you can say the other way around regarding Chokhmah. It's a something that has within it nothing. You follow what I mean when I say that? It's a something which has within it nothing, meaning there's nothing differentiated about it. <clears throat> yes. Right. 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 So that's a nothing which has within it everything, and that's an everything which has within it nothing. And that's a something that has within it nothing. Nothing's been differentiated, crystallized. And in that way, it's like the masculine. It's like that drop of energy, that, dry, that drop of, 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 of fluid life, which is then received by a receptacle in Bina, gestated, and there the differentiation takes place. Okay? And that's why this, you know, the, 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 the Jewish sources say that that drop of life originates in the brain and travels down the spine and then leaves the person's body in order to be re received by the female and gestated and give life. Uh, Hazal didn't necessarily mean to say that physiologically the drop is created in the brain and physically travels down the spine. But what they think they meant was that the origin of that fluid drop of life comes from Chokhmah and then travels down to be received by the female sphere, which is Bina. Physiologically, I think there's also some truth to the fact that 
the life-giving fluid is stimulated, the creation of the life-giving fluid is stimulated in the brain. The brain regulates all the different bodily functions. And that stimulation is, is, is impar imparted to the different parts of the body, which are involved in the production of that life-giving fluid, through the, nerve, the, the, the central conduit of the nervous system, which is the spinal column. And therefore, to a certain extent, Hazal were correct. Maybe the, the, the seed is not physically created and traveled down through the spine, but the inception of it certainly originates in the brain, and the messages that the brain sends to the body to create that fluid go down through the, 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 through, the, through, the, through the spinal cord, the nervous system, and give the messages to the parts of the body which are necessary to create that fluid. So, so Chochmah is that undifferentiated uh, life-potent potential. That's Chochmah. It corresponds to the letter Yud. The letter Yud. Why Yud? Because Yud is like that little drop, which is transcendental. It's not connecting onto the line below where the letters rest. It's hovering above that. So that's what Chochmah is. The truth is the lines of the letters are not actually underneath. They're actually on top. It's that when a sofa, you're a sofa, aren't you? Yeah. So in a sofer, the scribe writes the letters, he's actually aligning them up, not by lines, beneath, he's not writing on the line like we do in English, he's aligning them from lines above. And the quality of the Hebrew letters being very spiritual is to, to fly, to fly up, to be elevated. Like we say, the letters fly up into the air. And therefore, it's that line which actually keeps them down into the world. And some of them reach down, further than others, but the Yud stays like a balloon, hovering up. Pointing down, but hovering up. That's the Chochmah. So it's directed upwards towards Keser, but also looking downwards towards Bina. Yeah. Towards Bina, which would be the letter He. The letter He would be the feminine, the receptacle, which receives the fluid light from the Yud, gestates it, extends it through the Vav and gives birth to the final He in Malchus, where that Vav would be six. Chochmah, Bina, and then the Vav would either be Das or the six Spheros. Right? And then the final He would be the you sowed in the Malchus. But here, a Hochma del Yona, excuse me, here, a Hochma del Yona, the supernal wisdom on high, Perusal Kol Hanim Toim Kulam, is spread out over all creation. Im hi Yosoyne Elemes Venis Geves Milod, despite the fact that it is very elevated and sublime and hidden, nevertheless, its influence spreads over all. The Halea Nemar, about which Chochma, it is said in the Pasuk, can tell him, Ma Rabu Ma'asecha Hashem Kulam Bechochma Asisa. How great, how wondrous, how numerous, how elevated are your deeds, Hashem? All of them, Bechochma Asisa. They were all made through Chochma. So like I said, therefore, that Chochma is like that germinal seed. That everything comes from it. So it is something which has within it everything, or something which is, has within it nothing differentiated, but the potential to bring out all of the differentiation that occurs. Kulam, but chokhmah sisa. Everything comes from chokhmah. Kach roi la'adam shetiye chokhmah so metzuye bakol, and therefore it is befitting that a person's chokhmah, his intelligence, his wisdom, his spark, of life should be present in everything, just like the wisdom of Hashem is present in all. So too we should try and have our minds in everything. It doesn't mean to say that our minds should be involved in all things. That, that's not the point. But 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 we should have a a kind of a, a, like a, a germinal part, 
in everything. We should be thinking about the source of everything. If Chokhmah is the source of everything, so putting our Chokhmah in everything means identifying the Chokhmah of Hashem in everything. And therefore, everything that exists can be seen as an expression of the creation of Hashem. And we should also prepare ourselves and make ourselves accessible to all people and help and aid people as much as we're able. As much as he's able to share of his benevolent influence on others, he should do so. That's like Chokhmah. And he should not be interrupted or dissuaded or prevented from any reason whatsoever. If you take, for example, our uh, beloved and honored Rabbi Swag here in the yeshiva, he was a rabbi when I was sitting at the table, not at the head of the table, you know, more than 20 years ago. And he was full of Torah wisdom and full of insight and uh, full of understanding, as he still is, of course. But he was more healthy then. Over the years, unfortunately, as you know, has become more and more limited. And um, all of that diff- difficult pain and paralysis that he suffers, Hasrashal, and none of us should know from that, for most people would cause <laughs> just to stay home. That's it. I can't make it anymore. I can't leave my house. I can't travel. I can't get on the bus. I can't walk. Most people would just throw in the towel. So, uh, Rav why he can't live at home and come to the yeshiva. So what does he do? He lives at the yeshiva. All in order to be able to continue to give, to give, to give, to give, to give, to give. Because Masirus Nefesh, despite the pain and the difficulty. Can you imagine that? With dedication, with love for Klal Yisrael? A person must have to do that? He should be gesund stark. But just think about it how difficult it is just to move from one room to the other. And he lives in the yeshiva in order to be able to continue teaching and be mashpia shefa to Talmidim year after year, decade after decade. Huh? He's, he's an elderly person and he's married. Uh-huh. Masir's nefesh on both his, his part and the Rebbitzin's part. To be able to continue to be mashpia. Kodesh Baruch should be mashpia on him, gazunt, and refua, and bracha, and simcha, of Hashem, Torah, and Rucha Kodesh. Vihine, el hochma shnei panim. Hochma has two facets. Hapan ha'el yoin, the upper facet, the supernal facet, hapone ala keser, which is directed toward keser. So this would fit in with what I was saying before about. Chokhmah corresponding to Yud, where the Yud has two points, and the upper point would be facing upwards towards Keser. That's the upper facet. And that facet does not look down, as it were, at all. It doesn't look down, it doesn't point down. It points and directs itself upward to receive from Keser. It only receives from above. The second facet, hatachton, the lower, the lower, the lower part. Pone lamata, it's it's facing downward, like the lower part of the yud. Lahashkiach besfiros, in order to have providential care over the other spheros below it. Shehi mispashetes bechokmasa alehem, which it hokma spreads itself with its wisdom over them. So it's kind of like a mountain. A mountain's peak points upward. And there it receives from the blessings of heaven. And there, right, rain, snow, falls. Yeah? And that mountain peak is always only pointing upwards. But because it's always pointing upwards, it's receiving from on high. 
but it's positioned in a way where when it receives, it's then able to send and direct down in tributaries to the base, to the things below it. <clears throat> That's Chochmah, like that point, like that apex, like that mountain, not apex. <clears throat> so a person should also have these two facets. Hapan harishoin, the first facet, who is bodedusoi bekoinoi kedei loisif mechachmasoi ulatakno. The first one is meditating, solitary, solitarily, alone with God, His Creator, in order to constantly be increasing onto His wisdom and to correct it, to perfect it. So that a person constantly needs to be connecting privately, personally, with God on his own way, like, like being alone on the mountaintop. His own Moshe Rabbeinu, who ascends the mount in order to commune with God. But the whole purpose is in order to bring down the result of that communion to the base and share it with others. But in order to share, the first person has to scale the mountain. A person has to climb the top. A person has to get to the peak as much as possible. <coughs> and therefore, a person has to set aside time to meditate and to contemplate and spend time with God, learning on his own, Davening, it might be with the Hevrusa, right? But the point is, it's not in a, in, a, in a situation of giving over Torah. He's receiving. He's learning, either on his own or with the Hevrusa or from his Rebbe. That's the first aspect, the recipient. Vashaini, the second facet, the Lamed Bnei Adami Oisai Chokma Shekarosh Baruch Hu Ishpi Alav to then go teach and share with others the wisdom that God has influenced upon him. And I remember once somebody here said in the yeshiva that uh, the yeshiva's position in general is that uh, educators should not have a full-time job. Educators, administrators is a different story. Administrator is gonna, it can be a full-time position, but educators should not have a full-time position educating, teaching. Teachers should not be teaching full-time. Why? <laughs> yeah. They need to have a time of the day where they're constantly and regularly learning on their own and replenishing their batteries and gaining more information in order to continue to be able to teach. So the effective teacher is a student. And therefore, a person who wants to connect to this mida of chokhmah has to position himself between these two facets. On the one hand, you know, setting aside time to... Uh, develop his own personal relationship with God and with prayer and with Torah learning and then share with others what he's received. And just like then Chochmah goes back and it influences every single sphera according to the degree <coughs> that is <laughs> necessary and needed so to a person should also share with others to the extent to which this person is able to receive and what would be fitting for him to fulfill his needs. Because sometimes a person can inundate. A person can inundate. He gives up too much Torah or Torah which is too deep or too sophisticated, or too difficult for people, in a way that, that's really very, very problematic because the Torah is compared to water, and water is chesed. And like we say, Torah's chesed al l'shoinoi, that the Torah should be a Torah of chesed on a person's tongue, whereby that Torah, like life-giving water, rains upon people and bathes them in the purifying effects of it. But if a person is saying over Torah which is too difficult or too uh, deep or too theoretical or too abstract for his listeners, <laughs> so then it actually can flood a person. At that point, it's no longer mime, it's no longer mime, no longer chasadim, it's no longer Torah's chesed. Rather, it could be what we call mime zedonim, flash floods. Water is good, but if it comes in, a, in, a, in an undustable quantity, so that can actually quench 
any flame or spark of interest that a person might have. Could be like hot water burns you. Yeah, it could be. Like, yeah, it could be hot water which burns. It's scalding. Yeah, or it's just it's it's just too much, mm-hmm. and it douses the flame. So a person might be interested in Torah. And I know that's happened to people who've come into the yeshiva, for example. They thought they loved Torah. When they got here, <laughs> they feel they don't love Torah. God forbid. Because there's this tension which, which results of they're not having enough Torah knowledge to, to, to incorporate what they're being presented with here. And it's being presented in larger quantities than the person can take. And he loses an interest in Torah. So a person has to be very careful not to put too much onto a person at once. And it's going to vary, of course, from person to person, and teacher to teacher, and situation to topic to topic. I always have that concern with our morning class, like maybe I'm going into too much detail. I like it. <laughs> then it's appropriate for that level. I'm glad you like it. But for some people, you know, it's just, it's, it could be overwhelming. It could be too much. It might just be too early in the morning. After. Yeah, that, that could be. That could be. But a person has to be very careful not to give over too much. Like Hazal say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Digestion, exactly. Most of us would consider, for example, lean meat, poultry, fruits, vegetables, cheeses, grains, to be very healthy foods. But feed that to an infant. It can't. You can't ingest it, and you can't digest it. It could kill him. You can't feed an infant food, meat, food. You can't even feed him be- fruits and vegetables. You can only nurse or have formula. That doesn't mean to say that these foods aren't healthy. They're just not healthy for that person at that time. Yeah? Or putting in large amounts of food, or, or, which you can't digest. So the person's going to expel that either expel it from his mouth, or if he's forced to digest it, to swallow it, he could expel it otherwise. Because <coughs> I'll say, more than the calf wants to nurse, the cow wants to, or, or more than the calf wants to suck, the, nur- the, 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 the cow wants to nurse. Like the mother's got udders which are full of milk. Yeah? And there's so much pressure that she wants to just get rid of. She wants to share that. She wants to, she wants to, right? She wants to have that milk flow. So as much as the calf is nursing with enthusiasm, the mother wants even more and more to give. But she's got to hold back. The teats can't let more go than the baby can take. And therefore a person has to be careful to give more than is intelligible to the one who is being taught. So there should not, should, there should not arise from that some, some mishap. So just as the upper sphere either Kesser to Chochmah, or Chochmah to the rest of the spheros doesn't give more than what is, um, than, than what the spheros below them are able to, to receive. And um, in creation, I think at some point very early on in, in our introduction to the book, we were talking about the light of Ein Sof going through Tzimtzum and being directed into what's called Kalim, those Kalim being including the spheros, and there was what's called Shviros the Kalim the breaking of the kalim, the breaking of the vessels, which resulted from too much divine energy being brought into the space that was becoming creation. So that those vessels or that hierarchy, which was the prototype for creation, could not handle the flow and it burst. And the result of all of that was what we call achuraim, divine energy that was wasted and went down through the sewage, instead of through the plumbing. And that's the source for evil, negative forces in the world today. And part of the service of Hashem is to redeem those divine sparks which spread out through creation in the backside, what we call Achoroim, because of what we call Shvir Sekedim, the breaking of these vessels.
So a person has to be very careful with this. Certainly regarding teaching. A person's mashpia too much onto a Talmud. The Talmud might gain some information but not understand it correctly. Come to distort or adulterate what he's been taught. Feel frustrated that he's not able to really follow, understand, comprehend, or live up to what he's being taught. Leave the Torah, and that would be like Shvir Sekelim, where divine sparks were introduced into a vessel that couldn't contain them. The vessel broke, and then that vessel goes spilling those divine sparks into the dark side. Yeah, like alternate spheros or precursor spheros. So it happened before or it happened simultaneously? Before. So there was first negative and energy and, and evil before there was good? Well, I mean, there was the positive energy was being directed down into these kalim, but they were broke and then that, that energy was lost. Is it the same with the ten? Are kalim another word for spheros? Like the, they do, I don't think they're entirely interchangeable, but Kalim includes spheros. Kalim are like the whole apparatus, the whole structure, the whole hierarchy of the spiritual realm, which is not just the spheros. There's what we call Lamed Beis Nesivas Chokhmah, 32 kind of pathways of Chokhmah, which are channels that you were used to channel that energy as well. And so you have vessels and you have channels, but all of the vessels and all of the channels, they're all called kalim. And sometimes if you see a diagram of the spheros, you'll see kind of lines that interconnect the spheros. Yeah? Where, where are the diagrams? That's why I wanted to see this. <laughs> uh, on the internet. Okay. <laughs> no. um, you can maybe check um, R- Rabbi Ari Kaplan's book uh, or translation of the... Um, so yeah, thank you. So then these would be kalim. These would be a thing about uh, like capillaries, like uh, like glass vessels, or um, capillaries. Um, what was the word I used before? Uh, vessels and channels, I think. So it was a, it's a whole hierarchy of creation in the spiritual, which, pre, pre, which is a precursor to the physical, through which the divine energy was, initi- was initiated. And initially, parts of the system broke because of the intensity of that light. And that Shvira Sakalim resulted in the, in, the, in the divine energy spilling out behind the, the formal organized system of creation. Aside from there being a whole set of, of spheres of Tuma. There's, there's what we call the spheres of Tuma as well, that correspond to the spheres of Tahara. So there's a, a Chokhmah and a Bina and a Das and a Chesed and a Gvura of Tuma too. And they're also part of the backside. Um, but in any case, this should be a person's um, um, approach to, uh, to Chokhmah. So on the top of page Mem Dalid, Vaod, and furthermore, Biderocha Hochma Lihiyosa Mashgacha Salkolimitsius, it's also the property of Hochma to have providential supervision over all that exists. Like it says, Kulamba Hochma Asisa. Ipneshihi Hamakshava Khoshevis al Kolanimtsos, because Hochma is like the thought which precedes all creation. There's nothing that is not, there's no act which is not preceded from some thought. Nobody does something for nothing. Even if you say to a person, why did you do that? Oh, no reason. It's not true. There must have been some thought which activated that motion. It might have not have been an intentional thought, but a thought there was. So every single thing that exists, every single thing that happens is preceded by some thought. That thought is not the action, it's not the object. It's very far from it. A thought is not an action. It's not an object. But on the other hand, insofar as that thought is the impetus and is the catalyst for the action or for the object, 
So that thought is very much the act or the object. And therefore, chokhmah, kulan b'chokhmah sisa, means that chokhmah is behind every single thing that exists. Chokhmah is behind every single thing that exists. There's a thought which precedes anything, any action or any deed. Excuse me, any action or any object. <coughs> That's this spark, this impetus. That's chokhmah. And therefore, he, he phrases it as, as it were, that Chokhmah is thinking about creation. Regarding this dynamic, it says in the verse, Lo My thoughts are not like your thoughts. What does he mean to say by this? Lo My thoughts are not like your thoughts. Maybe what he means to say is, even though, even in the human sphere, everything, like I said before, suggested before, is preceded by some thought, it's not necessarily a directed, constructive thought, and therefore the actor or the object might be meaningless. Even though it's kind of, like I said, it has the impetus or the catalyst of a thought behind it. But God, that's not true. Nothing is, nothing is ser- serpendipious. How is that? <coughs> Serendipity. Nothing is serendipitous. Everything is with divine providence and for a purpose. Mm-hmm. So our, our thoughts aren't connected then? Our thoughts... Uh, well, they all come from the same source, right? Yeah. So, so your thoughts really are my thoughts, in a way. Uh, uh, meaning of God's. Yeah. Yeah. But I think what it means to say is that um, the, the expression of human thought is not always directed and productive. It could be haphazard or spontaneous. So it's true that in the human sphere, thought precedes some action or object, but it's not necessarily directed for some specific providential purpose. It could be just on a whim. I guess what I was saying is before that even something which is on a whim still has a thought. But that thought is, is, is different than God's and for, insofar as God's is never on a whim. God's thoughts and therefore the actions and the objects that result from God's thoughts are very well planned out according to divine providence. Maybe that, 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 that's, I'm suggesting that, that's what he's getting at. But it would still be everything. Chokhmah is still everything. So even if it's on the wind, even if it's... Yes. Even our thoughts would be an expression of Chokhmah. It's true. But, more, but, but, but a less direct expression, perhaps. Maybe, maybe after, after going through the tzimtzum of human thought. Maybe that's the part of the stuff that's still out. <laughs> through the yes, it could very well be. Wasted energy. Yeah. Yeah. Indirect. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, insofar as we are created but Selim Elohim we really should be responsible for how we direct that divine energy whose incipient is in thought. Unfortunately, we don't. But, but our mandate to live up to being created in the image of God would be to do that and to, and, and, and to try and make our thoughts, our thoughts and our thought process and the execution of our thoughts as God-like as possible. Still, that doesn't always happen. Mm-hmm. Torah, uh, Torah came before creation. Right, that was the only thing. So he's talking Kodesh Baruch Hu looked through the prism of the Torah and created the world where the Torah is the Chokhmah of Hashem. The Torah is the Chokhmah of Hashem. It's not the story of Moses or the, or the sacrifice of, of Isaac. Yeah, Yitzhak of Arisa means he looked into the deeper meanings of the wisdom of the Torah, which is divine intelligence, divine will. And it's through that that, that, he, that, 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 that he brought all creation into being. Like we say, Kutshabricho Veraisa Chadhu, that God and the Torah are one. Because the Torah on this level is talking about the inextricable aspect of divine will, divine intelligence. So, furthermore, Uksiv it says, Vechoshav Machshavois the Vilti Yidach Vimeno Nidach. God thinks thoughts to make sure that nobody will be led astray. I know my thoughts. Aleichem, nu Hashem, says God. Their thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give a person a good ending and hope for the future. What's the point here? What I'm hearing from this is that God's thoughts are not like our thoughts. We see something and we say, wow. How did that happen? That's evil. And God says, no. 
Your thoughts are not my thoughts. From my point of view, I see things much differently. And you should know that I'm constantly thinking about your thoughts of goodness and thoughts of peace. And if you perceive, for example, this person to be suffering and that to be a result of divine evil, God forbid, no. You don't understand. It would be compared to somebody who, for example, is very sick and the doctor has to apply very severe measures of surgery or applications of very severe medications and the person that might be writhing under the pain of the scalpel or burning from the medications in his veins, what are you going to say? That the doctor is malicious, mean, hateful, spiteful? No. The doctor's acts are purely chesed. It's chesed. He's saving this person's life. But, so, yeah. <laughs> the doctor had the power to, to mm-hmm. cure you without all those things. <laughs> and maybe yes, but if it, 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 that's right, but it, it, can't, it, it can't be done any other way. Well, Hashem could theoretically yeah, yeah. cure us and make everyone happy all the time. Right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but we know that that wouldn't fit in with the idea of free will. Yeah. yeah? God would be creating a, a facade of uh, people's uh, being able to transgress and without any repentance return and become pure, even though they really weren't, and it would just all be, uh, it, would be it would be a fake. It wouldn't be the real, th- it wouldn't be the real deal. Yeah. It would be like, a, you know, a father feigning to be impressed with his child, with his, with the, with the, ch- with the child's shortcomings. Anybody who's looking on would say, this, this is a farce. It's a farce. The parent has to act this way, perhaps, to keep the kid from falling apart. So he lauds him over, <laughs> over, over, the short, over, over his shortcomings, which he really should be reprimanded for. But he's got no choice. But it really shouldn't be that way. Ultimately, a father who does that for the child for his whole life is going to be raising a, dis- a, 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 a not a disillusioned, but... Yeah, <laughs> Not disillusion, but uh, what's the right word? Deluse, de- delusion. Yeah. So a person who lives is a state of delusion. And therefore, a person has to have his eyes open and aware of the needs of the people of God in order to help them. And his thought should be in order to bring close those who have been distanced or who are distant. And to think about them good thoughts, like we discussed yesterday. Like the mind is constantly thinking about the larger picture of good. So a person who wants to build a building might first have to tear the previous one down and dig deep into the earth. And a person who doesn't know anything about construction, this person's crazy. He's got a building, and he's destroying it. And after destroying it, instead of building up, he's digging down. The opposite direction. Who builds down? But anybody who realizes, understands, you've got to destroy the old and the dilapidated. And in order for the new building to be stronger and firmer and more secure, you first got to go down. The deeper down you go, the stronger foundations it will have to be able to be go up. But a person has short sight, he doesn't realize. He calls himself a contractor, he's destroying. He calls himself a builder, he's digging. <laughs> so a person should think about the benefit of his fellow man. <laughs> and to be thinking about good thoughts and different ways in which he can come up with advice which will be godlike the im amo ubefrat bikhlaw in order to benefit his god's people on a personal or even on a, on a general level the yote mehan haga toiva and the outcome of this very good way of behaving yinna halehu al hanaga ayashara it will bring a person towards a straight path. Mm-hmm. It will give him the wisdom and the proper thoughts to conduct himself and direct himself towards the proper behavior, which is straight. 
which is aligned. It is um, it's aligned with the uh, thought on high, meaning the kulang b'chokma sisa u'miyashera sa'adam ha'elyon. And what it does is it also aligns and synchronizes the Adam Ha'elyon. And what's the Adam Ha'elyon? The Adam Ha'elyon is the reference to the Spheros. Why? Because if we said that Chokhmah, Bina, and Das and the other Spheros correspond to the different parts of the human physiology, that's really a manifestation of the spiritual plane of the Spheros. And the hierarchy of those Spheros is also described as being like a spiritual constellation. And therefore it's referred to as the supernal man. This is, a bi, this is a, it's a term that's often used to refer to the, the hierarchy of the spheros. So if a person is acting with chokhmah below, he's causing the constellation of the spheros, which are the supernal man, the hierarchy of the spheros on high, to become aligned and in sync as well. So they have a proper posture. And when the spheros are postured, posturing properly, then that's going to be beneficial for creation. Okay, let's stop here and continue next time on the second part of this chapter. Mm-hmm.